And away they go. And we received here at the church an invitation for a graduation of the significant because we prayed for this young lady, Miss Maggie, uh, several months ago now. And uh, it was an opportunity for us to join with them at the Lake Charleston Pavilion. Uh, Friday, May the 13th, it's sort of an open house thing, 5.30 to 8. And uh, how many of you delight to RSVP? How many of you seldom RSVP, whether you plan to go or not? Let me see your hands. Thank you for that honesty, yes. You know that all comes back to haunt you when you ask for RSVPs. You'll never get any either, okay? And then you, oh, well, never mind. If you'd like the information here, uh, phone number you can respond or an email either one and I'm going to leave that right down here. Uh, Leanne and Ben Aikens inviting us to uh, Maggie's graduation part. Okay so if you'd like and you say I couldn't pick Maggie out of the graduation lineup. Well let me tell you it's, it's her idea that this gets sent to you all because she knows you prayed for her. So when you go you can just introduce yourself as one of the client over at uh, Faith family in Westfield, and she'll know. She she will appreciate you being there. So, just wanted to pass that along to you. Likely no surprise, and I'm going to direct you to Mark chapter 10 this morning. Although you would likely be expecting Mark chapter 11, which is the triumphal entry when Jesus finally arrives in Jerusalem, and there's palm branches and coats on the road, and Jesus comes right into town in a donkey, but. We, we, we got one more paragraph before we get there, even though this is the Sunday it ought to happen. All right. We started Mark back in the fall, and we've just been going paragraph by paragraph along as we go. And that's how close the Lord got us. Almost there. Just not quite. So you can read Mark chapter 11 this afternoon. And, and as you do, think about that horrible emotion that Jesus would have experienced. As he comes into Jerusalem and hears those cries of, of adoration, crying out for him to save them, Hosanna. And knowing that before the week is out, the cries will change to crucify him. And he weeps over the city as he arrives. Um, and... Uh, to some degree or another, you and I would have been on his mind because he came to fulfill that mission. Because we needed to save him, right? So, but before we get there, this one last miracle, Jesus is going to perform one more wow moment before Jesus gets to Jerusalem. I think there's one yet to come in this week ahead as he... Uh, you know, puts back in place a severed ear, remember, in the garden. But, but those glimpses of glory that came from Jesus' hands through physical healing, are that's just about complete. But not until this text, this last section here in Mark chapter 10. And we'll start reading in verse 46. Then they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus, so they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, stand up, he is calling for you. Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus, and answering him, Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. Let's pray. Oh, Father, to have been in Jericho that day and to have heard the sounds and seen the sights that those who were present that day were blessed to see and to hear. But that doesn't keep you, Holy Spirit, from taking this text, this account, and giving us insight into what happened and 
what it means and what we should do as a result. Make sure that we don't settle for just understanding, but that we move to the application you'll have for us personally, that we will be changed. And that we too will be better followers of Jesus as a result of our lingering before your word and submitting to the instruction of your Holy Spirit today. Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. Jericho is the last major city as you come in, headed for Jerusalem, up this valley. It's, it's a fairly easy walk from Jericho up to Jerusalem. If you're inclined to do any walking, it wouldn't have been bad anyway. Jesus and the disciples have got their sights set on Jerusalem. Jesus knows what awaits him. He's been trying, as we have heard four different times, just recorded for us in Mark. He's been trying to get his disciples ready but generally speaking, it's going up here, right? They're missing it. They don't understand. It doesn't fit with their definition of what the Messiah is going to do. To suffer and die? And what is this rise from the dead business? You know? It's twilight zone and stuff, right? But it's not just Jesus and the disciples. Now there's a whole crowd. Everybody wants a piece of the action. The momentum, the momentum is built to a, a fever pitch which is going to break out as they arrive in Jerusalem and they think that they may very well be welcoming their conquering king. And they treat him that way when he arrives. And so, so imagine the fervor that is around this crowd and the commotion that they would be causing. So much so that it, catch the, it catches the attention of a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. We need to understand that, uh, that, that to be someone with physical limitations in their day was, was even more difficult than it is in our day. We have established safety nets and we have increased in our consciousness of, of, of providing for and, and giving a hand up and, and so many people with those sorts of challenges excel as a result, yes? But in that day, a blind man might very well be forced to justify his existence by begging. Those around him wouldn't have thought he was capable of anything else much, and if he was going to be worth keeping around, at least he could sit around and ask for gifts. Right? It was a rough way to go. They would often be put in places where there was a lot of traffic at a city gate or or at a gate of a temple, if you know your word, some you know. In this case, high traffic area from Jerusalem to Jericho and back and forth, a lot of travelers. And there sat Bartimaeus and he heard the commotion. I have a friend who was, who was injured and, and blind in junior high. So that's been a long time ago, right? And he's instructed me, it's not that his hearing got any better, he just learned how to use his ears. Because he knew he was dependent upon them. He doesn't have super hearing. He just relies on them and has learned to, to take advantage of that. So Bartimaeus hears extra commotion, a large crowd along with Jesus and his disciples. And so maybe he grabbed the cloak of someone walking by and said, what's going on? I hear something unusual. He says, well, come on, man. Where have you been? It's Jesus of Nazareth. He's coming by. Apparently, apparently old Bartimaeus had heard of this guy. And hope swelled within his bosom. This guy's got a resume. Passing out healings. Maybe I can get on the list. Maybe there's hope. Maybe I'm not destined to remain a blind beggar my entire life. Maybe my life can be changed by this guy. 
factoring in other things that he had heard about him, he begins to cry out in hopes of getting Jesus' attention. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David? Well, there are Old Testament promises that one of these days God was going to send a replacement for their highly revered king, David. That there would be one one day who would sit again on David's throne and his kingdom would have no end. Bartimaeus, along with many others, thought he's the guy. Our conquering hero has come. And Bartimaeus wants to get his attention because he's, man, he's doing some pretty cool stuff. Maybe even heard about some other blind guys that have seen as a result of the contact with Jesus. But did you notice what he asked for? He's not saying, Jesus, son of David, I'd really like to see. How about throwing a blind guy a bone? That's not what he said. Did you notice what he asked for? Have mercy on me. Mercy. Jesus, I recognize who you are. You are the coming king. The descendant of David, you are the Messiah. All of that implied in the title that he chose. Don't give me what I deserve. That's what we're saying when we ask for mercy. He's acknowledging he's got no right before Jesus. He knows who he is. Maybe that brings to your mind another prayer. It was a parable that Jesus told, actually, about these two guys that went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, a very religious dude. Had all his religious ducks in a row. He, he's a guy that when he walked down the street, people, whoa. He's a religious something, that guy. And then there was a publican just about as far away from a religious mover and shaker as you can get was a publican. He was a tax collector for the Roman government who also happened to be a Jew. He, was, he, he sold out his own people and was feathering his nest. They were hated. And they both go to the temple to pray and the Pharisee begins to pray comparing himself to others. Hey God, I just want to make sure that you see it's me. It's not that dirty rat over there. It's not that guy over there. I'm not like them. Comparison, you know. Surely I look more impressive to you than these characters. We've got to be aware of comparison in order to make ourselves look good before God. Because God's not impressed when we compare ourselves to others. And then he starts rattling off his fine religious accomplishments, his tithing and, and those sort of, all these impressive religious activities that he's engaged in. That'll really get me in with God. It's not what God's looking for either. And as Jesus was often prone to do, he began to talk next about the tax collector who nobody thought would be the hero of this story. <coughs> The tax collector <clears throat> knew so well who he was, he didn't even raise his eyes to heaven as if to lock eyes with God. He looked down instead and beating on his chest in self-deprecation. And you remember what he asked for? Have mercy on me, the sinner. Not a sinner. The sinner. This tax collector knew how he stacked up compared to God. And he didn't have a thing with which he could recommend himself to God. Nothing. He wouldn't compare himself to anybody else around him. He wouldn't rattle off. He couldn't rattle off a list of fine religious activities to impress God. He simply asked for mercy. And Jesus goes on to say, that was the guy, the publican, who went home justified before God. He went home good with God that day. Not that religious dude that made it look on the outside like he was okay. Because he recognized his need for God. 
Pharisee didn't need God. He was making his own way. The tax collector knew he needed God and cried out to God for mercy. Don't give me what I deserve, God. Eventually, our New Testament theologians would call that grace. Grace is God doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. Mercy is asking God not to give us what we know we deserve. We deserve judgment. Because we don't measure up. If you're going to compare yourself to somebody, you need to compare yourself to the righteousness of God. And none of us measure up to that. That's why we ask, we seek mercy. Grace, they're hand in hand. Grace, giving us what we desperately need and cannot do for ourselves. Have mercy on me, son of David. That's what our old blind beggar was asking for. He recognized he needed God to intervene. Now there's an interesting thing there. It came up in another place. As a matter of fact, it's a misconception that I still hear banter about a bit. Whenever we see difficulty in someone's life, we often think it is there because they deserve it. That they're being punished because of sin. I've had those conversations. Maybe you've had those thoughts creep into your mind. Can I read for you from John chapter 9? As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Got it? And he'd always been blind. That's how he arrived. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he would be born blind. The assumption is something bad happened here and somebody's responsible for that. Maybe even this dude before he was born. Isn't that the implication that the disciples were asking? He's got this and he deserved it because he's a dirty sinner. And if it wasn't him, it's his parents. Somebody, somebody's getting it. Because that's surely how God works, right? And Jesus says instead, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Listen, the next time you encounter some grievous difficulty in your life, you know, some life circumstance comes into your world and you wouldn't have chosen it. It's just there. It's just a part. Would you be willing to stop and, and, and linger on the concept that it may very well be God says, I'm going to show off through you. Let me show people through you what I can do. Because before this chapter 9 is over, this dude's seeing again. <laughs> And the Pharisees are pulling their hair out. They're just driving them crazy. It's a great chapter. You got to read it this afternoon. Spend some time there. But I want you to watch the assumption that this guy was blind because he was a sinner and he was being judged by God. Listen, if that's the case, we're all in big trouble. You understand? Yeah. You say, well, I don't sin like that guy. It don't matter. It really don't matter. If that's the case, we're all in trouble. It occurred again. Jesus, this time in Luke chapter 13, won't be on the screen. Just let me read it for you. You can look it up later. Now, on that same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. The Galileans would occasionally try to pull a coup and take over uh, against the Romans. And in this particular occasion, it appears that they were in the midst of sacrifices and Pilate found them and sent the soldiers in and they killed those guys so that their blood was mixed with the blood of their sacrifices. And surely they're a bunch of sinners, right? They got what they deserved. It was on, it says that, that, that very thing. 
Jesus said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? Listen, it's a fairly common mindset we have. You sin and you're going to get it. I tell you, Jesus says, I tell you, no. No. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. <laughs> There's only one way to deal with sin, and we've all got it. And the one solution for sin is repentance. A change of mind, a change of direction. Don't go that way. Change. Get off that course. He says, or do you suppose all like, oh, no, sorry, do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? He gives them another factual account. And so you know that tower fell on them? God got them, right? Because they were nasty sinners, right? Jesus said, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Sin. It's not to be messed with. Jesus is going to take care of that sin debt that we all owe. But beware of that mindset that says sin is going to get you. You know who got punished for sin? Jesus got punished for sin. So Paul was able to write later on, there is now how much condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? No. There is therefore now no condemnation. There is none. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus took our punishment. <clears throat> Repentance is the solution to sin. That's what he calls us to. Old Bartimaeus knew that he didn't measure up. And so he asked Jesus, the son of David, for mercy. Don't give me what I deserve. He's asking off the A-list here, folks. He knows the most important thing for him was a right and reconciled relationship with God, that he needed that most. Not to get what he deserved, but what he desperately needed and couldn't do himself. That was his first request. Yeah, he was asking for mercy. And not everybody was excited about all the commotion that Bartimaeus was making. Don't be surprised if people try to shush you when you get serious about getting Jesus' attention. <laughs> they say, you hushed up, man. You don't, you, don't, you don't get in the audience with Jesus. Just be still. And it says he just hollered out more. If you've been in a place of desperation, you will not be deterred by a few naysayers. Especially when your opportunity is right on the cusp. You may never have another chance to get to Jesus. And so he just shouts all the more. And in that fateful moment, Jesus stopped. And it's not included for us here in Mark's text, but it is back in Matthew. Something was going on in that moment deep inside of Jesus. He felt compassion. He felt compassion for this guy, which he often did when he encountered hurting, desperate people. And he stopped. He said, you bring that guy to me. <laughs> Whoa. Bartimaeus, this is going to change your day, man. Compassion, compassion, you, you, it just keeps showing up in the life of Jesus over and over again. It's, it's, it's a word related to, it's, it's actually a word related to your innermost being. It, literally, it's a bowel word. It's like a deep rumbling inside. You cannot, you cannot ignore it. When your compassion has been triggered, you will not be able to ignore what it is that you have encountered. You will be forced to engage by your compassion, your deep feeling that if I was in this situation, I hope somebody would do something for me. 
That's compassion. It was compassion that kept the good Samaritan from going around on the other side of the road like everybody else had been. We live in a culture, folks, that prefers to go around on the other side. It's too, it's too messy to get involved. I, I don't want to risk my own comfort, my own security, my own ease. I'm not altering my lifestyle. The priest and the Levite had places to go and people to see in Jericho. And they went around on the other side when they saw that guy laying there beaten and bloodied and left for dead. But not the Samaritan. Why? Because his compassion triggered. And he saw that guy and he said, I gotta do something. <laughs> I gotta do something. How many years you guys been doing something for unborn babies? 30, 40 years or more? Got to do something. That's what compassion will drive you to. Jesus heard the cries of a blind beggar. I mean, this dude was at the bottom of the spectrum. So Jesus stopped because it triggered. He said, I got to help this guy. And he calls him. And, and it's, you know, you could almost, you got to read between the lines a little. They, they say to the blind man, take courage, stand up. He is calling for you. And throwing aside his cloak, he jumps up and Came to Jesus. Can you, can you? A blind man in a hurry in a crowd is probably not a real good sight, right? <laughs> He's going to get to Jesus, man. Who doesn't no matter who he has to crawl over or climb over? He's got on his hands and knees, but he's going to get there because Jesus has invited him to come on up here, dude. Might have won, won you a video prize if you could have got that one on. That would have been a sight to behold. That blind man trying to get to Jesus. And then when he gets there, Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Can you answer that question? What would you like Jesus to do for you, Max? You think about that. Evan, what would you like Jesus to do for you? If Jesus asked you that question like he did Bartimaeus, what are you going to tell him? You really ought to be giving that some thought. What do you want him to do for you? You and he ought to be having that conversation. I don't know how long it took, but Bartimaeus responded right away, I'm guessing. And it's actually a second request. Rabboni, Rabboni, he says. A title of honor and respect that only gets used two times in all of our New Testament. Master. Teacher. You know who else used it? Post-resurrection appearance in the garden. When Jesus speaks in Mary's name, and she says, Rabbi, she recognized him when he spoke her name. That sign of respect and honor that had already been indicated by his, his plea for mercy, because he knew he didn't measure up, he didn't have anything to offer Jesus in return. He just was asking for mercy. Don't leave me in the mess I'm in. He says, I want to see. I want to see. Can I suggest to you that he's moved from the A list to the B list at this point? Because he had way greater needs that he was aware of and he'd already been asking about those. Way more important than anything physical that's going on with you or anybody you know is the spiritual need they have and a right relationship with God. And mercy is required for God to be not giving us what we deserve but extending to us a gracious gift of eternal life. That's the only, 
real need on the A-list. Everything else after that is a subset. He goes to the subset when he asks to see again. And Jesus says to him, well, go. Your faith has made you well. Jesus knew what was going on in here by what he had already been broadcasting. His plea for mercy. His title of respect that he used for him. His refusal to allow people to shut him down. There was faith engaged in this blind beggar's heart that brought him to Jesus, assuming that he could do what he had already been up to and do it in his life as well. And so Jesus said to him, it's your faith that's made you well. And immediately he regained his sight. Jesus didn't spit on his eyes this time. He didn't make any mud and put on his eyes or stick his fingers in his ears. He didn't do it. didn't touch him. just said, it's your faith, man. You can see. And he could. And then might I suggest to you the only logical response Old Bartimaeus said, wow, I can see. I'm going with you, Jesus. Wherever you go, I'm right behind you. Because when you've experienced the touch of Jesus in your life, to do anything else is just unimaginable. But that you would line up and follow him wherever he's going. Wherever he's leading you, it won't matter. When Jesus has come into your life and changed your circumstance, you're going to line up and follow him. And if you don't, then I'm left scratching my head saying, something's not right about this. Something's not right about a work of Jesus in your life like this. And you're not going to follow him? Bartimaeus got it. And that's how chapter 10 comes to an end. Immediately regained his sight, began following him on the road. Just like that, Bartimaeus is becoming a disciple, a learner, a follower of Jesus. How about you? Have you experienced that touch? First and foremost, off the A-list, have you established a relationship with God through faith in Jesus? Abandoning your own attempts to be good enough to get to God on your own, have you come to Him in faith and abandoned your eternal destiny to Him, knowing He has done everything that needs to be done in order to make that gift available to you? It's just up to you to believe that He can do what He said He's done and receiving that gift. Reconcile is the word. That's the A list. With that list, have you been tempted? How else have you experienced his touch in your life? And what influence is it creating in you? There's a song that a friend sent me this week that we'll use for a meditation. Because all that that we've talked about today is soon to be reality as Jesus gets his way into Jerusalem and before the week is out has given his life on our behalf. It's a song by Charity Gale. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. And then I'll come back and close this. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 it says for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins of late I have taken to describing what Jesus was up to when he was here as a rescue mission <laughs> based on that text right there he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and held us held us potentially for all eternity, separated from a God who loves us, but our God intervened and provided a way that we might be rescued, did everything that needed to be done in order for us to be forgiven of our sin, 
and have a right relationship with God. Amen. Oh, God is good. Amen. All the time. Yes. Saturday, we're going to give the kids a good time. And you say, what on earth has an egg got to do with Easter? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. But it's a great excuse for us to get them all together and they'll be excited. And guess what I get to tell them about? What Easter is really about. The death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'll catch them between the gathering of their eggs and the getting of their prizes before they get to go home. I get it right there. I'll have their enwrapped attention. And I'll work hard to keep it and sow some gospel seed into those little hearts. And some moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas all at the same time. So you be praying and come on up and help and love on some people and It'll be a good morning for us to be together. Has anybody looked at the weather forecast? Saturday? <coughs> Not yet? Okay, we'll take that by faith. Last year, I think we postponed, didn't we? Yeah. Well, we'll hopefully not have to do that this, this year. And then we'll come together. Pardon? 56 and rain. 56 and rain. All right, so bring your umbrellas to hunt eggs. But I, I, you know how to get a hold of me if you want to check and see. If it's raining that morning, we will be waiting. You can bet on that. So we'll see. They may change it how many times by the time Saturday gets here. <laughs> it's a tough job. God bless y'all. It's been good to worship with you. Why don't you share some one another's before you go be the church. Have a great week.